Hi, this is Arthur, and you're listening to Nan Aaron, the founder and president of the Alliance for Justice on Two Rods Talking Politics. Hi, everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, and I'm speaking today with Nan Aaron, who is the founder and president of the Alliance for Justice. Hi, Nan. Hello, Kelly. How are you? Great. Uh, So uh, it's great to talk to you. I'm glad we're talking after uh, Biden is president because I'm feeling slightly better about the judiciary now. (laughs) Um, But I know there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, So talk to me a little bit about what the Alliance for Justice is, uh, why you started. It's been quite a long time now and uh, and what, what it is that you work on. Thanks so much for having me. It's really a treat to be on, particularly given that March is Women's History Month. Yes. Alliance for Justice is a national association of 130 civil rights and public interest organizations focusing on two things. One, for over 40 years, we have um, made sure during democratic administrations that federal judges, and I know your listeners know this, they serve for life. So they're very, very important. We make sure that that federal judges during democratic administrations are individuals who are demonstrate, have a demonstrated commitment to equal justice. And during Republican administrations, have fought hard to keep those nominees off the federal bench who will turn the clock clock back on women's rights, civil rights, First Amendment rights. And our other program called Bolter Advocacy works with nonprofits and foundations across the country, helping organizations navigate the C3, C4 world of advocacy so that nonprofits will be more courageous in their advocacy, but also know where the lines are drawn so they don't get in trouble. And tonight we're going to be talking about federal judges. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, I I know some about federal judges and I feel like I'm fairly tuned into this stuff, but I think I didn't really realize until the Trump administration just how many judges there are, how many get appointed uh, by uh, and then confirmed by the Senate. So can you talk some just a little bit about the the structure of the federal judiciary, what the, you know, sort of looks like, what the levels are and, and, uh, you know, we've all heard of the Supreme Court, but, you know, what are the other courts and what are the kinds of things they're doing? Sure. So we all know there are nine justices on the Supreme Court. And currently of those nine justices, um, six um, have been appointed by Republican presidents, three by Democratic presidents. Uh, We then have the Court of Appeals judges and um, these judges are quite important because the Supreme Court decides fewer and fewer cases each year. So often it's these very powerful courts of appeal that end up making the final law of the land. And then the bottom level are district court judges, and they're equally important in stature, but uh, and they serve at, at the, in the lowest rung. All these judges and justices serve for life, The only way you can get rid of a federal judge is by impeachment for a high crime and misdemeanor. And therefore, uh, federal judges are critically important players in our democracy these days. Uh, We've got Congress, we know makes the laws. We've got the executive branch. enforcing the laws, but it's our judiciary that interprets the laws. And why judges and justices are so critically important now is because we have had four years of 
the Trump administration, which has prioritized putting federal judges on the bench above anything and everything else. Think about it. There were over 200 pieces of legislation that ended up at the doorstep of the United States Senate. And the only priority that Mitch McConnell, majority leader, took up was confirming federal judges. And that's because federal judges serve for life. And because of that, uh, can really implement a president's agenda. One other thing to remember for all of us is that the House has no role to play in, on um, judgeships. It's just the Senate. The president nominates and the Senate confirms. The House is, is uh, unfortunately, uh, has no role in the confirmation process. So that in a nutshell is why judges are so important. And I guess there's one other factor, and that is in our society today, almost every decision regarding our environment, our consumer rights, um, safety in the workplace, race, gender discrimination, almost every decision that is made in America today it's really one that's governed by a federal judge. Our federal judges not only serve for life, but have enormous power over every aspect of our society today. So I remember when I was hearing so much about the Trump administration, uh, you know, putting through so many judges. And as you said, like that was sort of the primary thing that the Trump administration actually did. And the only thing really the Senate did <laughs> for four years was uh, confirm judges. And, you know, I would hear about it and I would realize it was important, but I just felt helpless. Like I, I know what to do if there's a law there talking about passing that I don't like. I don't know what to do if there's anything I can do if there are judges that seem unqualified, if there are you know, people being put into positions in the federal judiciary that just don't seem like they're going to, uh, to take the rule of law seriously. So what is it that, if anything, that, that we can all do? What can we do to pay attention to it? What can we do uh, to stop bad appointments? Uh, you know, what, what would you recommend? Well, Kelly, so I'm really glad to be speaking with you today because there is so much we can do. And let's flip this a little bit and talk about the Biden administration, because within the next two weeks, we will see a slate of nominees um, issued by the White House for federal judgeships. And this is an opportunity, a beginning to address and repair some of the damage that's been done to our federal judiciary. After all, the Senate judiciary, the Senate confirmed nominees. One nominee said, you know, um, uh, contraception causes breast cancer. Another nominee uh, was, was named, was sent to the Senate because she was opposed to in vitro fertilization. I mean, you, it's hard to describe how indifferent and hostile Trump nominees were uh, to the progress that's been made by women. We now have an opportunity to change that and repair the damage that will be done by these lifetime appointments. And what we all need to be doing is the minute those nominees' uh, names are announced, Republican senators will begin to go on the attack and will challenge this nominee and that nominee based on their records. And yet, from what we know about the nominees whose names will be sent to the Senate is that these are men and women who want very much to continue and to advance the progress that we have made in this wonderful democracy in support of women's rights, civil rights, the environment, consumer protections, 
uh, union rights. So what we all need to be doing is speaking up, contacting our senators. No matter what state we're in, every senator will have a vote. If you're in a, 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 a state with a Democratic senators, let them know you care about these judicial nominees and you call on them to stand up. If you're in a state with two Republican senators, then you've got to speak up as well and call on them to support these nominees. And if they're opposing these candidates, you've got to organize groups to go to the newspapers, uh, to go to your local legislators, maybe your House members, and speak up in the state. Um, it's critically important. And why is it important? And, and the, uh, one other thing I should mention, there'll be states with, like Pennsylvania with a Democrat and a Republican senator. And in those states, it's important to urge on your Democratic senator and um, urge on the Republican senator and urge them to do the right thing. It has been the case over time, really up until the Trump administration, the groups on the right have been very noisy and very loud uh, in, in terms of getting Republican senators to nominate judges who are hostile to women's rights, civil rights, voting rights, and groups um, seeking to overturn Roe versus Wade have been the most vocal. Interestingly, the Trump administration changed that. And because the nominees were so unacceptable to the values that we hold dear, individuals across the country rose up. Look at the thousands of people who came to Washington to protest Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation. Think about the hundreds of thousands of people, women and men who opposed Donald Trump's nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. So what we've seen is hundreds of thousands of individuals involved. And now is the moment. It's all our moment. Seize the moment, seize the time to support the confirmation of judges and, and judges, I'm hoping, who are demographically diverse as well as experientially diverse, meaning they come from all corners of the legal profession, support their confirmations. Alliance for Justice has a project called Building the Bench which prior to the Biden administration collected hundreds of names of fabulous people for judges. We've got to all be out there lending our voices and in support of these wonderful candidates whose nominations will be before the Senate for votes. What is the best way for people to uh, to keep track of who those people are who are being nominated to learn something about them so that when they call their senators uh, to encourage them to to vote for these uh, to confirm these nominees they know something about who who they are what these what these justices stand for Sure well there are many national organizations that are actively engaged in monitoring the judicial, federal judicial process. And I would say Alliance for Justice, along with these organizations, our website, afj.org, will have up to the minute information about who these nominees are, their records, the state of play in the Senate, as well as talking points. And this is very important, talking points for activists and individuals around the country to use in communicating with their senators. Excellent. We'll make sure to put links to that on our website too. I, I know for sure I have not paid much attention in the past <laughs> to these lists and want to make sure that I do a better job of that. That's one, that would be wonderful. Wonderful. Um, it's important 
that the Senate Democrats hear from all of us. Again, uh, before Trump, it was really the right wing that was engaged, engaged over a desire to overturn Roe versus Wade. Well, we have shown over the past four years that groups on the left and even groups in the middle want judges on the federal bench who are open-minded, who are fair-minded, and will give litigants that appear before them a fair shot. Um, We do believe that this administration will be sending up a list of wonderfully qualified candidates, and it's up to all of us to help them cross the finishing line with the Senate. So I wanted to ask, too, about uh, H.R. 1 actually has a provision. So H.R. 1 is the uh, bill that was just passed by the House. We'll go to the Senate now, the For the People Act. And I know a lot of people uh, focus, and rightly so, on the ways that it uh, makes it easier to vote and does things with uh, redistricting. But one of the things in it uh, actually would affect the Supreme Court, as I understand, that the, there's currently a judicial code of ethics that doesn't apply to the Supreme Court, uh, but that there is something in H.R. 1 that could start to make sure that Supreme Court justices are actually held to a a series of ethical guidelines. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, As as it stands, Circuit Court of Appeals and District Court judges must abide by a code of conduct. As you rightly say, Kelly, uh, justices on the Supreme Court uh, do not need need to follow that code. This has resulted in many Supreme Court justices, particularly Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, Brett Kavanaugh, um, engaged in um, attending fundraising events by right wing groups and lending the prestige of their office in helping these groups uh, raise dollars. Now, if Alito and Clarence Thomas and Brett Kavanaugh were lower court judges, they could not um, help fundraise for right-wing organizations. But because the code of conduct does not apply to Supreme Court justices, they can do pretty much what they want. And there is a provision in HR1 that seeks to ensure that that code applies to all levels of the judiciary. And it's very important in terms of maintaining the confidence of all of us in the ethics of Supreme Court justices. Uh, We've seen Supreme Court justices Clarence Thomas a few years ago accept very expensive gifts from parties uh, who might be litigating before that court. So you certainly don't want uh, Supreme Court justices to be accepting gifts, fundraising for big corporate donors um, or right-wing groups. And then turn around and hear cases, decide cases, often brought by these same organizations. So it's important that the that HR one be passed. I'm told it's now not coming up for several months in the Senate, <laughs> um, but we're hoping that that provision remains intact. Yes, absolutely. It seems just wild to me that we wouldn't hold Supreme Court justices to a higher standard. <laughs> Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then I have one more question about uh, Senate confirmations of uh, judicial nominees. There is something I've never understood. Uh, I think it's called the blue slip process. Uh, could you say what that is? And I, my understanding is that perhaps it, it won't be continuing, um, but I'm not quite sure I understand what it is. Okay, we're going to get a go down a little bit into the weeds. With blue slips. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I love the weeds. <laughs> blue slips are literally blue slips. 
And blue slips are used by the White House to engage in conversations with senators over judicial nominees. So let's say this, the White House comes up with some names of nominees for, let's say, some seats in Louisiana. And eh, let's take Pennsylvania. I like Pennsylvania. Um, before the White House can send these names to the Senate, they've got to share the names of Pennsylvania nominees with both home state senators. That's Toomey and that's Bob Casey. And the rule is that they literally send these blue slips to the senators. And if the senators approve of these nominees, they send them back. And bingo, those names are uh, sent to the Senate for nomination. But sometimes the White House will send names to, let's say, Texas, as we saw during the Obama years. Well, what did Cruz and Cornyn do? They didn't send back blue slips. They just sat and sat. And therefore, the White House couldn't move because the White House believed it was important to get a conversation going with home state senators over specific judicial nominees. Well, in that case, um, the Obama White House just couldn't move because the two senators wouldn't send back their blue slips. We now have a situation um, whereby after Trump, the White House does not need to send blue slips for circuit court nominees to home state senators. They still need to send the blue slips uh, to home state senators to, um, and uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee Chair, Dick Durbin, has said that if the senators refuse to send back their blue slips, um, he just might consider various options, including doing away with the blue slips. But essentially, they were designed to ensure that there'd be a conversation between the White House and home state senators when nominees from that state were being considered for judgeships. Ah, all right. So now I understand. <laughs> Thank you. And I uh, love Senator Durbin. He's my senator, <laughs> one of my senators. He's a wonderful senator, and we are just delighted he's chairing the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. Yes, absolutely. Is there anything else that you'd like to make sure we talk about today? Uh, I think the only other thing worth, I think, repeating is this is a moment we have to seize um, in order for all of us to get involved and get active and to be communicating with our senators. Um, send us at Alliance for Justice names of wonderful people for judgeships. Um, we are um, prioritizing public defenders, civil rights lawyers, plaintiffs lawyers, public interest lawyers, union lawyers. It's for too long, Democratic presidents have put uh, former prosecutors and corporate lawyers on the bench. Certainly some of those sh lawyers should be uh, nominated, but we're hoping to really expand the pool to include lawyers who have a very keen understanding of how the law affects everyday people, please hop on our website and be in touch with us. Uh, we would love to be helpful, provide talking points, and do whatever you all need for us to do to um, help activate as much participation as possible. Excellent. We will make sure that we put all of those links on our website so people can find them. Uh, and I do hope that everyone uh, keeps paying attention. I know we started to pay attention finally to judiciary under the Trump administration, and hopefully we all keep paying attention now. Uh, so thank you so much for speaking with me and uh, thank you for the work that you're doing. Well, Kelly, thank you. And thank you for your wonderful podcast. And thank you all. 
who are listening. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dimcast Podcast Network. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Emu Nuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at Two Broads Talking Politics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.